Hello, welcome to the Eyes Up Life podcast with your host, Ben Grannis. How are we doing today, people? I'm in New England, and yesterday, as I'm recording this yesterday, it was uh, blisteringly cold, and now it feels like it's spring. It's almost 50 degrees. Um, Anyway, so I am here to introduce you to the third episode of the Eyes Up Maxis interview series. If you're new to the podcast or the video series, first of all, welcome. We're glad you're here. This is a project that was born after I completed my uh, 7,000 mile bike ride to raise awareness for distracted driving and digital wellness. And it is a project that was started in mid October of 2022, uh, where I, Ben, uh, drove around the country about 6,000 miles and interviewed 21 athletes and affiliates of Maxis Tires. Look up Maxis Tires, maxistires.com. They make the best tires in the world for anything that has wheels. I'm not kidding. Check it out. Um, They have some fantastic athletes in their sponsorship wheelhouse, Rolodex, whatever you call it. Um, And this week, I am glad to share the conversation I had with Jeff Kabush. Jeff Kabush has had a storied and extensive career in the mountain bike world and now more recently in the gravel cycling world. I'll let him share some of his uh, experience himself, but he is uh, Canadian, but I met him in the Bay Area. Um, It's interesting as I go through these introductions, I'm reminded of, you know, where I met the person. And on this particular day, uh, when I met Jeff, I had had brunch with one of my cousins in Oakland who I hadn't seen in seven years. Then I met Jeff And then I drove from the Bay Area in California to Mammoth Lakes. And that was, uh, first of all, quite a long drive, but also the change in weather was just stunning. It went from 60 degrees and pretty sunny in the Bay Area to almost zero degrees and tons of snow up in Mammoth. Um, So that was cool. I have little snippets of memories from... Um, all these great conversations as I uh, record the intro and conclusions for these podcasts. So so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jeff Kabush. Stick around to the end to hear a little preview on what's coming up next. Enjoy the conversation. Goodbye. you could just start by introducing yourself and saying where you're from and a little bit of uh, background on you. Yeah, my name's Jeff Kabush from west coast of Canada and uh, race bikes of all kinds. Started out mountain biking uh, back in the 90s and uh, had a successful career all racing World Cups and now I get to race and ride all kinds of fun domestic events across different cycling disciplines. And uh, Yeah, I've been working with Maxis since 2004 and a lot of cool relationships in the industry and lucky to still be riding my bike for a living in my mid forties now. Yeah. It's, it's so impressive. <laughs> How did you get into cycling? I think, uh, I mean, getting into cycling, I was lucky kind of growing up in BC, kind of one of the best places in the world to mountain bike. But yeah, I kind of played every sport kind of through, you know, elementary and school, a lot of track and field basketball but I had some friends who were kind of getting into racing and just started driving around with them to weekend events and kind of got kind of got hooked on it at the end of high school and decided to focus on that as my main sport and had some early success and kind of kind of got hooked on it and got connected to with some some good people in Canada there's really kind of a, a ladder to climb in BC a lot of other pro pro racers around me that I could see the pathway and uh yeah, I kind of committed to that and went to school, university for a little bit. And when I finally graduated school, I was uh, making a living as racing my bike. And lucky enough, I've been able to focus on that for the last 20 years. Do you remember looking back what your first, like what that first race was that was kind of like the, okay, I could do this a lot? I mean, there are definitely a few breakouts. I mean, the race that kind of really hooked me, there's a Canadian series I've been racing, kind of local BC and 
did some of the, the Canada Cups, which started on the West Coast and started doing well as a junior. And that kind of led me to travel across the country and I qualified for the, the World Championships that, that year, uh, which was over in Germany. And uh, flew over there and that was kind of eye-opening to see how big the sport was over in Europe. And that kind of kind of got me super excited about the sport and hooked on it. And I think it was after that I kind of really committed to the sport and working hard, got connected with some good mentors and yeah, I just kept working my way up and yeah, it was kind of, you know, really a passion for me until around 2000 kind of had a breakout season. I went to Olympics that year and had my first big kind of international breakthrough. And that's where I'd say I started making a living as a pro and uh, yeah, been lucky enough to call that my job since then. Can you walk me through some of your successes and kind of like the highlight reel of your career so far? Yeah, I mean... If you want. <laughs> uh, I mean, highlights, I guess. I mean, working up, uh, mentioned the first big breakout was that uh, Olympics. I was kind of a long shot to make the Canadian team, but qualified in, in Sydney in 2000, where the Olympics were. I finished a top 10 ninth place, which kind of really launched my international career and um it was a tough tough time in the sport uh in the early 2000 there's a lot of uh drugs in the sport and uh, luckily I was able to survive through that period and uh around 2004 or so things started to, to improve and had started to actually finally win a couple domestic races and have more success internationally and you know, I think had a bunch of World Cup podiums through the mid two thousands, and definitely, I think one of the highlights of my career was winning a World Cup in two thousand nine uh, in Bromont and Canada in front of the home crowd, and just after battling in the sport for so long to have that one day where kind of stood on top of the podium was pretty special. And uh, I mean, there's just so many fun events I've I've done over my career. Um, had lots of victories, but man, just so many special memories traveling around the world and uh, getting to ride my bike. What is it like doing a race as a professional? Like, what what goes through your head at the start? How long is the race, and what does it take to win? Oh man, there's so many different disciplines, but uh, man, I've been doing racing for so long; it's pretty natural. But uh, a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of different disciplines. Most of the stuff I've done is mass start, so it's a little more relaxed. Definitely some of the individual start stuff like downhill and enduro there's definitely a lot more nerves in the, those short events and for a lot of my career I migrated towards the more endurance stuff which was took a lot of discipline I think a lot of the work got done in the off season so the homework was done away from the races and when you showed up at the race it was just uh putting that that work work to the use out on the course and um you know, I'm definitely methodical in my preparation, so I was, I was confident going into into those races to to perform. But I think I took a lot of value out of the sport in that in that preparation, and uh, why I've been able to surprise and or why I've been able to survive and still having fun is that kind of challenging myself to see how far I can push. And the cool thing about about mountain biking is, man, there's always something something to learn. Even now, I'm still progressing in the sport and learning new things and I mean exciting seeing the equipment evolve in my career as well but yeah it takes a it takes a lot of time to have success in that sport in the sport what are some things that you like what are, what are like the elements of training and preparing for competition besides riding yeah I or mean, is it a lot of riding <laughs> <laughs> definitely I mean to have success in the sport just takes a lot of a lot of time people especially in an endurance sport, it takes a lot, a long time to develop and something you can't rush um, for sure. And I mean, the biggest thing and one thing I've been lucky in my career is just staying healthy, um, staying healthy. And I think uh, for me, one of the keys is never thinking that you've made it or know everything. And uh, for me, for sure, you got to keep, keep learning and keep humble and uh, learn from the others around you. Um, I've really, done that a lot in my career, whether it's about nutrition or training or racing or tactics, uh, trying to be aware, learning from my competition and always, always keep improving. And that's what kind of has kept me going in the sport.
What were some things that you would attribute your success to? Like maybe it's something that you're genetic, not not to blame it on genetics, but like was there something looking back that helped you excel that uh, that you would, yeah, it, or it could be, could be work ethic, could be you're really tall or well, yeah. What, what would you say? Success? I mean, I think I just, success in the sport, one big factor was I just love to ride and, uh, wasn't that I was, you know, racing for the ego and the accolades. It's just that I love to, to focus on the sport and ride my bike and, and have fun. And that's what like I said, it just takes a long time to to succeed in a sport. And yeah, I think I just had the mental capacity to push myself in training and, and still enjoy it. And for sure in my career, mountain biking, there's a lot of technical aspects. And I think I was lucky to grow up in BC where it's really technically challenging riding. So that was really a strength of mine, uh, racing against the, the international fields. I could always really rely on those skills to recover and uh, be faster in those sections. But I also paid a lot of attention um, to detail and equipment and uh, learning my equipment and set up as far as suspension and knowing the limits of the tires and using those technical skills as an advantage to be able to run lighter, faster tires or take advantage of those skills on the course. How did you learn all of that? Uh, again, I mean, it's just time. I mean, I guess I had kind of a more technical background. I did engineering in school, so the equipment was something I was always thinking about. Um, been a strength on the on the course and the endurance disciplines was my my technical skills. And that's where I'd really excel. Like on muddy technical days, the World Cup I won was like after torrential rain and thunderstorm, and knew the limits of my bike and the equipment and what pressure I could I could ride because I'd you know ridden in those conditions growing up and. I uh, took the time to learn about my bike and equipment where a lot of people just like to ride their bike and leave those decisions up to mechanics. But I've always been involved in the kind of R&D and equipment kind of development and it kind of pays off to know know your machine. Totally. Yeah. Um, talk to me about the, uh, like the community of professional mountain bikers because I mountain bike for fun and it's every, I love it because of the community and, you know, going out with a group, no one's being super competitive. It's really supportive of, of an environment. So is it, what's it like at the, at the higher level? For sure. You know, I've had made a lot of great friends racing throughout my career, especially at the, in the U S the domestic racing, uh, everyone's pretty close, uh, traveling the world to the world cup or all over the world, but you see the same people over and over again and become, pretty close friends spending time, um, at the races together. And, uh, it's, uh, great to see familiar faces when you're in foreign countries. So you come pretty close with the domestic riders, seeing them around. And yeah, it's pretty special, especially where I come from up in BC. It's, uh, mountain biking is such a part of the community. The local trail organizations are pretty incredible up in BC, what they accomplish in the communities, building trails and hosting social events. So it's, Super cool to see the sport be such a part of the community up in BC and different places in the world. How does it compare being down in the Bay Area of California to up in BC? Well, pretty pretty spoiled with the trails up in BC. It's uh, man, every community has hundreds of of trails, literally hundreds of trails that would be just the uh, iconic piece of any trail network in the states we're just so lucky with the train and the forest we have up there and how easy it is to build so it's yeah somewhat ironic being here in the bay the birthplace of mountain biking over mount tam and marin where there's hardly any trails that uh, mountain bikers are allowed to ride now so definitely uh try not to take it for granted man the the trail access we have in canada and um yeah, it's definitely uh, more of a struggle with the land use in different different parts of the, the country and around the world. But uh, yeah, really grateful in such a good place in BC where I grew up.
any favorite uh, races or courses that you've uh, done that stand out? Yeah, I mean, people always, like, ask my favorite place to ride in the world, and for sure it's BC. There's, uh, didn't get to do it a lot earlier in my career, but now BC Bike Race is one of my favorite events for sure. It's kind of a seven-day mountain bike stage race around the, the trails I grew up on, and um, one of my favorite formats is for sure um, Blind Enduro, which is you ride the trails without seeing them first, and Typically, there are four to six days where you're camping out in a social environment, kind of traversing terrain, whether it's been Transprovence or Stone King Rally going across like the French Italian Maritime Alps or Trans Cascadia in the Pacific Northwest. It's just a really fun atmosphere where uh, you don't have to be too stressed about practicing. You're just riding trails on site blind, and it's kind of like the, the purest form of, of riding and reacting and uh, yeah, definitely a format I really enjoy. But yeah, the Pacific Northwest is uh, pretty legendary for good reason. The, the trails and definitely enjoy any events I can uh, do up there. Can you talk a little bit about the different disciplines within mountain biking? Yeah, the mount mountain biking's changed a ton since I started. When I started, it was really just cross-country mountain bike and downhill mountain bike. Um, and now, man, uh, it's, it's hard to decipher. There's so many different disciplines. Um, I mean, XC is still huge as well as downhill, but now enduro, which is kind of like rally car, uh, racing where you do stages is, uh, going in popularity. But, um, yeah, I mean, gravel is a huge discipline that's emerged the last 10 years, which I do a little, a little bit, uh, as well in the off-road um, but yeah, there's, uh, even in the endurance side, there's anything from short tracks, which are 20 minutes up to marathon distances that are three, four, five, six hours, different events I do. Uh, it's a pretty wide range, um, uh, depending on the, the train organizer, but yeah, it's neat. There's something, something for everyone in the off-road disciplines now. So is enduro, is it, is it always a stage format? Or I'm just like, even, what, what is even, <laughs> even within enduro, there's quite a few different formats. The enduro world series is usually over two days and it's, um, you have to typically you have to pedal around between the stages, but sometimes there's uplifts. Um, the stages can be anywhere from one to two minutes to 20 minutes long, mostly gravity oriented, but there's still a bit of pedaling. And then there's blind enduro, which I, I enjoy because you can't practice it all, so it's a little less committing. And those are usually more like in a backcountry format where you're kind of traversing uh, from place to place uh, in like kind of a neutral liaison. You're pedaling in a kind of social group, and then you arrive at stage starts and go one at a time, 30 seconds apart on stages again that can be anywhere from one to two minutes up to 20 minutes long, again, mostly gravity oriented on these trail bikes which you are probably the most popular bikes that people buy these days but yeah both really uh, i mean yeah xc is man it gun goes and it's start to finish enduros yeah more like yeah like i said rally racing where you're neutral kind of riding between the stages racing the the segments or stages in between kind of like a multi-stage downhill race these days it's Got definitely it. pretty committing What's the format in the Olympics with mountain bike? Because also, wasn't there a new, a new format of mountain biking in the the most recent Olympics? Or no, Olympics got brought or brought mountain biking in in 1996, um, which really kind of blew up the sport. And I mean, the XC discipline has changed quite a bit because when I started, it was two and a half hours long and. It's shrunk to a much more compact course for TV coverage, but now typical uh, World Cup XC events are hour 15 to an hour and a half. Um, that was the first off-road discipline, and then uh, BMX got brought into Olympics. Um, not sure if that was, I think, 2008, the first uh, official BMX event. But as far as mountain biking, it's just, yeah, um, XEO, XEO, cross-country Olympic discipline in the Olympics, um, downhill, 
hasn't got accepted and yeah it's just really tight on the number of athletes they led in the olympics and so it's they've been trying to get cyclocross which is another discipline in the winter olympics but uh doesn't sound like that's likely to happen wait so it is cyclocross it is or is not no they're trying to get it into they were trying to get it into the winter olympics they've even done a race on snow in uh they're gonna do it again this year in italy but it's i don't know if you've Seen cyclocross, hopefully, yeah, living out on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, last year in Valley Soul, they did a race entirely on snow. But they've been lobbying to try to get an Olympics, but it doesn't sound likely. So talk to me about your Olympic experience, because you first went in 2000, right? Yeah. And how many appearances have you had? I went to three, so yeah, 2000, I kind of was a bit of an underdog, but qualified, and uh, yeah, that was really special experience down in Sydney, kind of breakout result for me, and really cool experience. We were early on in the Olympic program, so I got to hang out there and watch some other events, and really enjoy the experience, and 2004, I didn't go after uh, a couple other Canadians, later admitted DPO, got selected, and uh 2008 was kind of the peak of my career, uh, Beijing Olympics, but um, unfortunately had a few mechanical issues over there, which was super frustrating. Finished 20th, and then London was my last Olympics in 2012, where I had a solid ride for myself at that time and finished 8th. Yeah. So. I mean, that's so impressive. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, no, that was one of my best rides of the year by 2012, so it was... Happy to finish it off, and yeah, tried tried to qualify again in 2016, but just things didn't line up for me. So, what's been the biggest setback in your career, and how did you get through it? Man, I've been lucky not really to have any uh, major injuries in my career. I mean, the biggest uh, challenge in my career for sure was uh, the drugs in the sport. Um, Dealing with that, uh, even the Canadians weren't immune to taking shortcuts. Um, but, you know, a lot of my friends had to, you know, quit the sport and find different ways. But uh, can't say for sure why the choices I made. But, yeah, I think I was more just intrinsically motivated, internally motivated to see what I could push, how hard I could push and what I could achieve by myself. So... I mean, I can't have any regrets. I mean, I can think where would I have finished if the sport was clean during that period. But luckily, I was able to survive and, uh, you know, stay in the sport and eventually obviously had a lot of success. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely a challenging period in the sport. And for myself, you know, knowing guys around me uh, were on drugs and even early on was a neat kind of naive training with these guys and, just thinking, how am I ever going to be as good as them after just getting smashed and training day after day? And uh, luckily, you know, eventually I was able to just, you know, focus on my myself and the process and found some other training partners. And, um, yeah, I was able to progress and um, survive on my, my skills in those kind of darker days of the sport. And that's, yeah, why I, you know, felt... I think so special when I eventually had success at the World Cups, eventually winning one in 2009 after, yeah, surviving through those those darker days of the sport. Where do you think the sport stands now? Do you feel like it's in a much better spot? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I'd never, you know, vouch for everyone in the sport, but we cycling is one of the sports that's worked really hard on, on anti-doping and introducing more measures with the whereabouts program. Um, during my career, I had to fill out a calendar where I was every day and guarantee I'd be somewhere for an hour every day for the drug testers to come up and um, definitely pain in the ass, but something I was more than willing to do for, for clean sport. And that kind of limited, you know, how much, uh, how much cheating went on, but for sure it's not 100% these days, but uh, clean riders can definitely have success as I I proved and a lot of other you know clean athletes have proved and um, it's definitely done a lot of advocacy in uh, my career around clean sport and anti-doping 
That's something I really believe in. And yeah, a lot of those guys who took shortcuts, uh, you know, they were rewarded with results, but yeah, struggle now mentally and uh, feels really good not to have any skeletons in my closet and uh, really proud of everything I've done in my career. Yeah, and to have all the success you've had knowing that you earned it. Yeah, and I think uh, at that time some people didn't understand, but now more of it's come to light. People, yeah, I've earned a lot of respect in the sport, and I think it's part of the reason that I'm still able, still established, and, uh, you know, have a, a really great place in the sport right now. What sort of a role, this is a bit of a pivot, what sort of a role has social media played in your career in terms of promoting yourself and uh, just sort of showcasing your experience? Because you've, your career spanned the before growth and now during sort of the peak of social media. Yeah, social media's major challenge these days. It was sure a lot simpler and I think enjoyable as an athlete when I started. I mean, um, we just rode our bikes and we always had obligations, but there's kind of a clear pathway. And I mean, when we, social media, Twitter was, uh, I think cycling was an early adopter of it and it was kind of fun, fun at first and same thing with Instagram. And then became really challenged as it became more and more monetized. And, uh, I think a lot of young athletes really struggle with it. Some people embrace it and have a ton of success, but some athletes just aren't aren't cut out of it. And it certainly um, had a huge impact on mental health, especially during the last couple of years of, of COVID when racing completely went away and there's even more pressure put on athletes to, to post and in our contracts and obligations. It's a huge part and really hard to, to balance that stress and, keep it in perspective how important it is and comparison. So it's something that, yeah, I've really been having a lot of discussions with uh, some of the companies I work with and some of the young athletes and um, yeah, the whole athlete versus influencer is a really challenging subject right now. Yeah. How, um, how, how has it sort of shifted since COVID? Like, so your contracts literally changed because of the shutdown of races or? I think, uh, I mean, we're lucky we were in a good industry that's still doing well. So, but I mean, obviously the racing went away, so more pressure was put on the online presence of athletes. Um, and it's just become more and more, emphasized in in athlete contracts as far as incentives and performance demands and it's been great i mean it's opened up whole new opportunities for some non-racers to have a presence and make a living but um yeah for those athletes who just want to be athletes it's been a um, for some it's been a real struggle to to find the support or um we had well last year the major race series in the U S part of you had to apply to get in. And part of it was kind of your presence, some of the criteria that was weighted, whether you got accepted to the series or not. So, um, I was quite vocal about that because there's some athletes that, I mean, they just want to be athletes and that'll affect your compensation, obviously how much, uh, visibility you have. But when it starts restricting access to sport, that's when it becomes really challenging for some athletes that want to, focus focus on the goals and um not all the other distractions and yeah it's really hard now it's part of the sport if you want to make a living and um have a hard time yeah talking to young athletes who are really really struggling with that that process and demands of that and you know sometimes i'd just recommend get a part-time job instead of the stress of dealing with all the the online work these days yeah, that's that's super interesting to hear you say because I feel like there's a there's a lot of opportunity to not have to have a part time job if if it's like if it's something that you feed into, but a lot of people don't. Yeah, I mean, just really affects. Uh, I mean, I'm a mature athlete, but yeah, it has a huge. It's it's just always another background pressure, and some athletes that uh, don't handle it as well can yeah really affect the a mental health and a huge, huge distraction. I mean, social media is a huge 
uh, topic of discussion uh, in our society as well as in sport. Through your own experience and your conversations with other athletes, what have you found has been helpful in terms of striking a healthy balance between the promotion side and you know having any sort of like personal relationship to social media? What's been healthy? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is what I've tried to do in my role is like, yeah, talk to some of the sponsors I work with and their relationships with athletes to not overemphasize it. I mean, for sure it's a part of it, but I think some athletes um, start to think that it's everything instead of the sport because there's a lot of things athletes do offline at events, interacting with people, you know, clinics or riding with people in the community that are important as well. And I think it can tend to get overemphasized how important it is. And that can be really stressful and trying to talk the, the sponsors away from the pressures to post, post, post. I really, you know, like it's kind of cliche to be authentic online, but I think a lot of the time, like less is more instead of, uh, I mean, I think the biggest struggle is mixing this personal space of social media with the, uh, yeah, the commercialization and that kind of personal and space with the commercialization is really a hard thing to manage. And, um, yeah, I don't have, you know, all, all the answers for that. And, uh, I think as a, yeah, an industry, we're really struggling to figure that out right now. And I mean, we've seen Facebook come and go as I was effective. And I think really seen a swing now and Facebook, it swung so commercial, it's really turned people off. So, I mean, yeah, a lot of riders. From the athletic point, I mean, it's just, yeah, talking to young riders, like uh, posting or even getting sponsorship dollars doesn't make you faster if you really, what you care about is your personal goals. And, yeah, you got to make that priority and obviously fit in what you can, you know, fulfilling your commitments on the side. But, uh, yeah, it's just keeping that in perspective is really hard these days. How about in your own personal life? Like how do you balance like time on social media to you the rest of your life? And is it, are you intentional about it? Would you say, or is it kind of just a natural process? I definitely, I mean, yeah, try to be aware of how much time I be I spend on my devices and how it makes me feel. Um, I mean, Obviously, it's like this, we have a lot of downtime recovering, so it's easy to get drawn into that. And I mean, I think just being aware is the first step. And yeah, I mean, just for example, like I just uh, was waste. I'm not really much on Facebook, but I had the app on my, my phone. And every time I use it, I'm just like, what am I doing here? What's productive about it? So, I mean, yeah, I just deleted Facebook off my phone and I still use the groups on on my computer to check in find some useful information as you know just from on the community groups but yeah I think it's just being awareness awareness of yourself and what you're doing and how it's making you feeling and yeah I don't think uh, uh, a lot too much time makes people feel great so it's um, yeah it takes a lot of discipline too but yeah to turn it off and put it away and I mean yeah some strategies people I think big strategy is to turn off all those notifications because it's just, yeah, triggering the endorphins, you know, getting the likes and comments and stuff. So, I mean, the biggest strategy is, yeah, to turn off all those no- notifications so you're not getting getting pinged all the time. And if you do post something, you know, it's part of the job. But, yeah, post and then try to walk away with it and then, you know, not be just checking, checking, checking. I say come back and interact with people but yeah try not to make it uh, kind of an always on thing right yeah absolutely um you mentioned this the the amount of time that in your own awareness of time spent on apps do you ever use the the screen time feature on your phone to kind of monitor things yeah i do use the screen time but i mean which monitors on my computer but man i don't find it i don't know why if it's just like i leave my computer open it says i'm on for like 24 hours and i know the data hasn't really made 
much since. I haven't actually. How about on your phone? Uh, well, it, like accumulates both the computer and the phone, so I haven't really. Oh, it does combine it. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, I just haven't paid too much attention because it doesn't seem accurate. Like I'll, I don't know if I leave my browser open, it like says I'm on like for eighteen hours a day, which which is not true. No. <laughs> But, I mean, yeah, I just try to be, yeah, aware of that, like, you know, scrolling, 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 or, like, oh, not trying to check comments and interaction all the time. Try to, you know, do my work, walk away, and then, yeah, come back and check on the interaction, answer some comments, and not try to, you know, just, like, when you're out for dinner with your family, you're not going to answer your phone. Or when you're hanging out with your friends, try to, like, yeah focus on what you're doing and yeah find uh, obviously you know athletes have a lot of downtime so try to be productive with my downtime or do something that you know is interesting or makes me feel good like learning or reading a book instead of just scrolling doom scrolling which takes a small amount of discipline and effort but once you get there like I, I find myself in the same trap like oh I'm on my phone I could just take out a book my yeah. phone's in my pocket, book's over there, you know? It takes, yeah, conscious effort to, like, uh, break that addiction. And, um, yeah, being aware of it is for sure the first step. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you're a, a cyclist, obviously, and you've spent time, well, you spent a lot of time on trails, but also on the road. So I'm curious to hear about your experience throughout your life uh, and recently about um, or with distracted driving uh, both as a cyclist and as a driver as well yeah I mean uh, spent a ton of, ton of time in the city riding on roads and uh, my whole life and I mean it's definitely been a skill set that really had to develop even more uh, as my career has gone on being aware of drivers and cars and trying to read their attention or or their read their intentions because it's um yeah i mean definitely had some acquaintances who've uh been hurt or lost their life from distracted driving and yeah like I mentioned it's pretty scary just when i'm at a stoplight or sitting in a cafe just watching the cars go by and how many eyes are just looking down at their phone not paying attention um so something I'm super aware of and uh, obviously riding off road, it's not as much of a worry. And I think big reason we've seen in cycling a bit of a move away from road riding to gravel riding is getting away from that, that traffic. Uh, but for sure when I'm on the road, um, I mean, it seems crazy. Now I have a blinking red light I train with on the back of my road bike. Uh, it seems crazy that I didn't used to do that when I was younger but for sure when I'm in traffic um luckily I'm tall so I can kind of see a few cars ahead to kind of try to read the intentions in traffic and for sure hyper aware riding through the city looking at drivers front wheels to see if they're they're turning in on me or not and uh luckily I've only had you know one one small incident in uh my career a car pulling out and slid across the roof but no no major incidents, but certainly a lot of friends have been hurt or injured or even even worse. What keeps you motivated to continue to ride on the roads despite seeing tons of people when you're just off the bike, you know, distracted or having people you know, close friends affected by it and you affected by it directly? I think I still, you know, enjoy the, the beauty of road riding, but I definitely choose where I do it a bit more. Um, we're here in the Bay Area and Marin County uh, across the bridge from here is one of the most beautiful places to the ride in the road. So, I mean, around here I pick routes where I'm not going through the city traffic lights too, too much. I mean, I think that's why I choose to ride across the Richmond Bridge here over to Marin where I can, you know, stand bike paths and ride through minimal lights or Lucky here even in the Bay, it's only 10 or 15 minutes from here up to the, the Berkeley Hills and into some parks where there's not as much traffic, but um, definitely 
have to have the radar on for sure and being kind of hyper aware in those 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 times coming to the city but i think that's choice made uh in other places where i spend time up in truckee tahoe i just don't ride on the road as much anymore because there's uh can take out the gravel bike and do four or five hour rides and hardly see any traffic and um yeah just seen a decline for sure um in in driver behavior so um still there's beautiful places to to ride on the road but i'll definitely i'm more careful with my decisions on on where that is or just much more aware in those situations when i'm in the city how about when you're do you have a car here yeah how about when you're driving what are your do you find that you're tempted to be on your phone or distracted in other ways or what's what's your experience no i mean i became much more aware i mean just with some friends and there's been some campaigns in cycling after some of the racers passed away and so yeah i definitely make a conscious conscious effort to kind of put away the phone when I'm driving. Um, we don't drive a ton here, but um, yeah, when I'm driving with my, my girlfriend between on road trips, yeah, really, when I'm driving, I just try to drive, and it's yeah nice when you have someone else in the car to um, take care of even the music or podcasts or entertainment. And if I do hear my, my phone buzz, I can ask my partner to look at it, and uh, yeah, just... Too many sad stories. So yeah, definitely try to make a conscious effort to kind of ignore the phone when I'm driving if I need to pull over. It's... Right. Yeah. Um, what's what would you say to? Because a lot of the country is not like you, um, and uh, so I mean you've seen it. So many people are on their phones when they're driving in some capacity. What would you? What do you think is going to be the most effective thing to try to get through to those people? Like, what what do we what do we do or have to say to to make a change? Yeah, I mean that's a tough answer and tough solution. I mean, I mean, yeah, you can. I don't know how to reach everyone. I mean, it's just. I mean, I've seen the consequences, and uh, I know. For me, it's just, yeah, I mean, reading some of the facts on how slow your reaction time is when you're distracted and how far it takes to stop. And, I mean, I've seen the consequences, so it's easy for me. And I don't know if, yeah, experiencing a little closer some of those consequences is what it takes. And, um, yeah, I worry about the future, and I don't know if uh, more and more there's safety devices building cars and um it's not a solution but hopefully that helps cut on cut down the fatal fatalities eventually but i mean yeah it's um hard to break that habit and um unfortunately uh we're gonna see more accidents and i don't know what the best answer to that is what would you say to someone who you know, say we had an average American here who said that they're really good at multitasking and could maintain focus on driving while responding to a text or looking at their, their phone in some way to try to get that habit to change without, without them having to experience a close call or, you know, killing someone. I think, I mean, if I ever have the chance is just, yeah, communicate the story about a friend who's he's lost their life and yeah, try to make that experience real to them, what the consequences of their action can, can be. But, um, yeah, that's hard to where you have those conversations, but I mean, yeah, I think raising the awareness is, is one. And, uh, I think that's, I mean, I was guilty before for sure, checking texts on the road and, but yeah, really hurt hit home when, yeah, people I knew were, were killed by distracted drivers. And um, that's what I think of when I reach for my phone is the, the consequences of it. So it makes it easier for me to, um, yeah, ignore it and focus on the driving. Are you aware of the uh, driving focus feature on your phone? Yeah. Do you use it? 
I had it on for a while. Um, I don't have it on currently just because uh, when I was, yeah, traveling in the passenger seat. Right, you want to kinda... be able to get notifications. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's a good idea that maybe takes a bit of refinement. But, um, I guess I, yeah, trust my own discipline, but I think it's a good feature to make people awareness, but I'm sure, I don't know what the statistics are, but I'm guessing it hasn't been wide adoption. But Yeah, it's been interesting because I've asked most people that I've talked to if they know about it, and I think you're, I mean, you're one of maybe two or three people out of you know 15 so far that know about it and had actually used it. Um, and it's, it's so, yeah, I think they could do a much better job of making it known that it exists because... It's, I think it's a great way because most people are driving by themselves, uh, on the yeah. road. They're not passengers in the car. So, yeah, yeah. and that's the same for me. I mean, I've been driving just by myself. So it's like a, it's been a great tool to prevent notifications and the, the text. I don't know if you use the text auto reply thing. I did that at first, but yeah. And then it was just felt weird texting people all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was really good to kind of, I mean, I used it for a while. And I think it was effective to kind of break that habit, I guess, or make me aware of that, you know, just like social media, the desire to check, check. It kind of like helped, yeah, make me aware of what I was doing, I guess, and help break that habit. Yeah. yeah I also agree that it's it sometimes feels annoying with all the texts that are sent while I'm driving. But the, I think the pros outweigh the cons for me because it's, it sparks so many conversations with people about yeah, yeah. what that, well, first of all, what the feature is, like, well, how is your phone doing that? Because no, a lot of people don't know. Yeah. And then also just that I'm, and whoever's using it is taking distracted driving seriously and trying to make yeah. a change. So I think it. But you can change that message too, right? Or, yeah. Or yeah. turn it off. You can turn it off yeah. or change it to. Something yeah, shorter yeah. that's like yeah, not yeah. a whole paragraph, but um, yeah, it's totally custom customized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm just hyper aware on the bike. I don't know if it's just being tall, but yeah, I mean, just picking up those cues, like looking at the front wheels if they're turning, or just reading people, looking for eye contact if people turn left in front of me. I mean, I think just. For sure, like for new road users, it's like picking up all those clues and cues. It's uh, you can see why so many accidents happen, I and mean, I certainly have uh, avoided a lot just by yeah, kind of reading the body language of the cars or picking up those small cues of wheels or eye contact, whether people see me or not. Yeah. How is it in Canada? Is it any different? Is it noticeably different the number of distracted drivers, or is it just as bad? Just as bad, yeah. I think it's just a function of how many people in the cities and intersections, how they're designed. I mean, um, I think infrastructure is can be a huge part of making the roads safer. I mean, we're here in Emeryville and a uh, small Bay Area community, but um, he's become well known by really advocating by, for bike streets and bike infrastructure. And uh, around the Bay here, it's quite good when I ride over to Marin, I can stay on bike path almost the whole way um, over to, to Marin to avoid avoid the traffic, which is nice. And those, yeah, I mean, protected bike lanes and protected downtowns. Um, obviously, angers a lot of motorists, but um, a lot of the studies, the benefits are pretty clear, even for the businesses around those protected bike areas, the economic impact. So... Hopefully, like uh, most things, it can have the science lead the debate and um, uh, make more space for bikes on the roads. Yeah, I sure hope so. I mean, it's it's great that a lot of cities seem to be focusing more on bike lanes and cyclist safety. Um, yeah, I want to wrap up here, Jeff, by talking about the youth in the country, the younger people, the youth. <laughs> um, because, uh, well, there's two 
statistics or facts that I think are interesting. One, and I think as a professional athlete, I'd love to hear your input on it. The average American gets their first cell phone what, between the ages of seven and eight. And the average American will spend about five years of their life on social media over the course of their life. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on those two things and what, what you would yeah, any advice or guidance to try to, you know, help people understand how much there is to life outside of phones? Oh, yeah, that's uh, going to be interesting to see that effect on society for sure. And I mean, I don't have kids myself, but a niece and nephew, and I know that, yeah, struggle when to give kids access to technology and the screen time and the challenges, but Man, I just, yeah, I really feel like, yeah, one of the last generations to grow up without social media. And I mean, feel like it was such a healthier space even to make mistakes. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes as a young person. I'd be crucified for if they're caught online now. And to grow without everything being recorded and... I think just having that, I mean, a big part of why I feel like riding my bike is so healthy is the, just the time I have alone. I ride al alone a lot and it's just the, the mindfulness and the time to kind of be alone with, with my own thoughts. And I think that's one thing I worry about is, yeah, people just are never, never have time alone with their own thoughts to kind of, um, think about things and process things because we're always, yeah, engaged all the time. And, um, I mean, every generation has that worry about kids having too much time with the TV and kids too much time with the screen, try screen time. And, um, I don't know where we'll be a generation from now, but, uh, I worry, worry about the effects of it that we're just starting to, to understand now. Um, what was the, the screen time and what was the second one? You oh, just getting a phone between seven and eight years old. And the other one? Oh, oh uh, just the effect five of... years on social media. <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's obviously, you know, a lot of positive things that come from online, but I mean, I hope, I feel like the pendulum's really swung to stuff that's just algorithms and commercialization and um privacy as well and i'll be interested in even the next five to ten years um how that develops um and i have no idea where we're gonna end up but sure appreciate the the childhood that i had offline yeah I, well i'm sure the um because it sounds like you've been doing a lot of work with younger athletes who are kind of like the first wave of athletes that grew up at least closer to social media than when you grew up. So yeah. I'm sure that's really helpful for them just to have a little bit of a sense of grounding and understanding of... Well, just be an advocate for them. I think it was uh, really sad. I mean, I wrote a controversial article um, earlier this year, I guess it was about athletes versus influencers and the role of social media in an athletes life. And, um, I think it's something that a lot of people think about, but not many I've talked to because it's the loudest voices you hear from and the loudest voices are the successful athletes on social media. So I almost felt like I was being an advocate and I got so many messages from young athletes that were really struggling with that, uh, as far as the the opportunities and the pressures of social media and being online. And, um, so I hope hopefully just like, um, distracted driving. Yeah. We could become more aware of it and its impact and we'll see where, where that leads. Any closing thoughts, Jeff, uh, things you're looking forward to cl wrap up thoughts from this conversation, anything. Um, yeah, take, take a break. Um, 
get outside, get off the phone. It's even something I need to struggle. I struggle with, uh, but man, it's, uh, it's rewarding to, to put down those devices and just go experience life outside or just interacting with friends. Um, that's what makes me sad, uh, hanging out with groups of people in one room when they're just all on their phones. So put those down and talk to people. Sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, if everyone did that, I think we'd all be a lot better off, right? Yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of different, different places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your time, Jeff. Really appreciate yeah. it. That was good. Well, 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 you made it to the end of the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jeff Kabush. As you could hear, he is such a nice guy, super generous with his time. Um, I forget if I mentioned this in the beginning. He was kind enough to put on his full bike kit and get out on his bike and ride around a local park for me to get some B-roll footage. I'm actually not sure if it made it into the video because I haven't seen the video as I'm recording this. I'm trying to savor the release of all of the videos. So they're as new to me as they are to you lovely people. If you haven't seen the video yet, make sure you check it out on YouTube at Maxis Tires. It's also on Instagram on Maxis Tires page and mine at Eyes Up Ride. Give us both a follow. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it now. Share it with a friend. Give it a review. Rate it five stars. All that good stuff. Thank you so much. And Next time, in two weeks from today, we'll be talking with Mickey Thomas. A little bit of a shift of gears. He is another power sports guy. So in the same world as Jeremy McGrath, but uh, he does it a little bit differently. So stay tuned for that conversation. He was one of my first interviews, so kind of cool to look back on that. Um, Anyways, hope you have a great rest of your day and your week, wherever you are and at whatever time of week it is. And we'll see you next time.